It's hard to admit you're wrong. It's even harder, as current events readily prove, to admit not only mistakes, but moral failures that harm others, especially if you're in a position of power and influence. Many try to protect themselves at all costs. Politicians, kings and queens, bosses, and even parents find admission of failure, mistakes, and sins extremely threatening, and today's study is no exception. David, the beloved king of Israel, the darling warrior and poet, the soon-to-be architect, completely loses his moral compass and the incredible position of moral authority he holds in Israel in straying into adultery and murder. No matter what accentuating circumstances of battle-induced PTSD he may be afflicted with, he is confronted by God through the prophet Nathan and must deal with real guilt. In our day and age, with our very liberal culture moving the goalposts so often, that is getting harder and harder to recognize. These images try to convey that the pain of these actions affects God as much as us, and that God expends great effort in reaching out to us as with the prodigal son, to restore us in forgiveness and grace. Let's watch. Welcome to our online service today. We are glad you are joining us. We continue our ongoing study in the theme of prayer. So let's begin praying together, the to call it for purity. Let's pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, 
to hear his holy word and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm, strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting Amen. We continue our theme of prayer today in the preaching of the word. But before that, let's read together Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is an amazing psalm of repentance. So let's read this together slowly. Have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then 
I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me begin by telling you a little story. Once upon a time, there were two men in the same city, one rich, the other poor. They lived next door to each other. The rich man had everything a person can ever desire or think about. He had made his millions raising cattle. The poor man lived in a small house and had nothing but one little female lamb, which he had bought and raised. It grew up with him and his children as a member of the family. It was more of a family pet than anything else. It ate off his plate and drank from his cup and even slept on his bed. One day, a traveler dropped in to visit the rich man. He too was well off and had made his millions raising cattle. He felt obliged that he should at least bring the man dinner as a gift of appreciation. But he was too stingy to take an animal from his own herds or flocks to give as a gift to the rich man. So he snuck next door and took the poor man's lamb, killed it, and prepared a meal to set before his guest. The end. Now, you're probably upset about the injustice of this story. The man did a despicable thing. Imagine sneaking next door and killing someone's family pet. Of course, if you know the story from the Bible, you will recognize it from 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. This is the story of King David, coveting and then stealing another man's wife named Bathsheba. His adultery with her, then his attempts to cover up his sin by arranging the husband's murder to cover up his action. Five of the Ten Commandments broken in one sordid scheme. And this is done by a man who was a believer and a follower of God. It tells us that no one is immune to the pull of sin and evil. It takes Nathan the prophet to confront David and use, basically, the opening story to convict David. The Bible tells us that after hearing about the lamb that was slain, David explodes in anger and says, As surely as God lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this ought to be killed. He must repay for the lamb four times over for his crime and his stinginess. And then Nathan says, You are the man. The, that moment of realization of what he has done comes crashing down on David guilty as charged. It is well worth reading 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, and I suggest you do that later on, because no Bible story describes the heart's convicting quite like 2 Samuel chapter 12. And no Bible prayer expresses the lips of repentance like Psalm 51, which we just read which we're going to look at in more detail. But let's pray first. 
Well, Father, again, I thank you for my friends here gathered. And we pray now and we invite the Holy Spirit to move among us today. Lord, as we think about your word, we pray, Lord, that you would shine a light into our hearts. Help us to see us for who we really are. And so we would pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. King David's fall from grace is not a new story. Daily, we hear about things like this on the nightly news, or read about them in a novel, or watch them played out in a movie. It is the dirty reality of living in a fallen world. And sometimes, sadly, it's our story as well. Maybe not exactly in every detail, but we have betrayed another person. Our actions or words have collateral damage. We are caught red-handed in our sin. And sometimes we need a Nathan to say, you are that man, you are that woman. We allow the Holy Spirit of God to do the convicting of sin and ask him, where, O oh God, have I sinned? Show me, Lord. And sometimes it's glaringly obvious in our lives. Sometimes the Lord will gently point out an attitude, a thought pattern, an action that needs to change in our lives. And so we pray that the Lord would speak to all of us today. Now, I believe that the prayer of Psalm 51 can be broken down into three parts. First of all, realizing. In verses 3 to 6, David prays basically, I recognize my rebellion, my sin. It's not just acknowledging his sin, rather he knows them. He knows it's spot on. Knows them only too well, for they're always there. A shameful, walking nightmare. That is a awful thing to experience, the guilt and the shame. You cannot escape it, a walking nightmare. And it's kind of like Lady Macbeth in Shakespeare's play, Out Damn Spot, is a line that Lady Macbeth says while washing invisible blood from her hands in her guilt. David, in a moment of complacency, falls greatly into grave sin. He was vulnerable. I think he probably was in his 40s or so. He might have been overwhelmed in life by the concerns of leadership in Israel. But at the same time, he has it all. There's no one greater than him in the land. And so instead of leading his men in battle as he should have, David decides to stay home. He takes a vacation. I've done it all. I deserve a break. His affair with Bathsheba is a result. Bathsheba is a married woman. Her husband is Uriah. David arranges Uriah to get killed in battle in order to cover up his deed. A despicable thing. It's all a sordid, dirty, horrible plot. Everything in his power is put into play. David tries to cover up what he has done, but he gets found out. Bible tells us it's an interesting verse in Numbers chapter 32, uh, verse 23. But if you fail to keep your word, then you will have sinned against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. And when you think about it, it always happens. Because after all, the Lord knows everything in you and me. Sin doesn't go away. It's not eradicated when we try to cover it up, or hide away, or deny it, or even forget about it, or even try to avoid it. Sin will 
find us out. And you don't have to be a Christian to know that. 99% of people have a bit of a conscience. That's the bad news and the good news. Because we know that there is only one person we can go to to get rid of that stain in our hearts. Only one who knows that sin that we thought could be buried, it is the Lord. And so David says in verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. We take full responsibility for what we've done. We don't say, well, everyone else is doing it. We don't blame it on our our hormones, hormones, hard word to say, or our mood, or our age, our circumstance, or whatever. I take full responsibility for what I have done. I am guilty as charged. I'm not going to try to talk my way out of this. Full realization. Guilty as charged. And like David, we should say, verse 4, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You'll be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Yes, David sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, and, in fact, the whole kingdom of Israel. But David knows real guilt. He knows where it can only be relieved by the Lord. David also recognizes the fact of original sin. The fact that sin is a matter of not just what we do, but what we are and always have been from birth. Now, this is really difficult for many people to understand. We are not born good. It's actually the very opposite. But it's important to see here that David is in no way regards his innate sinfulness as an excuse. Far from saying, it isn't my fault, I couldn't help myself, that's just the way I am, he feels all the more responsible. So principle number one, repentance prayer is truly realizing. Secondly, Repentance prayer is pleading. David pleads to the Lord for forgiveness of his sin. Blot out the stain of my sin. Purify me from my sin, he prays. Now that word sin might be too familiar to us. So retranslate that word sin. And our own conscience might be quickened by hearing David use words like, blot out my rebellion, my critical attitude, my sharp tongue, my greed. Also worth thinking about is how David pleads for mercy. He knows that he deserves none and that God would have all the right to abandon him to punishment he so deserves. Blot out my sin. That is the heart of repentance in this psalm. His public sin, he wishes to be wiped clean. Verse 7, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Wash me clean, he prays. Now think of it. In our day, To wash ingrained dirt out of, let's say, filthy clothes simply means for most of us selecting a different program on the washing machine at home or sending the clothes to the dry cleaners. But in David's day, it was a long and painful process to get stains out of clothing. The meaning of the word cleanse here suggests to remove whatever hinders or disqualifies 
So cleansing is just what is needed from the, the gravity of sin. And it keeps us from God. And there is only one solution to that, a new heart. So David pleads, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Remember the story now in 1 Samuel, where it says that the Spirit of the Lord had come upon young David when he was first chosen to be king to replace King Saul, who you might remember really went off the rails. And it says this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. But in the very next verse, it says this, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. I think David is fearing in verse 11 that what happened to Saul might happen to him. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me, David pleads. And again, verse 14, forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. That line, then I will sing joyfully. Do you think David might have been in a place of deep depression while all of this was going on? I think so. Had his writing and composing of psalms dried up during that time? Maybe. This prayer pleads with God so that David might sing again. Repentance prayer is pleading to the Lord. And pleading prayer leads somewhere to change and expectation. So finally, the third principle, prayer is change and expectation. A truly repentant prayer leads you and me to make course changes in life. We do not stay the same. We do not remain with the same kind of attitudes that we repent of. We change them. We go the opposite way. Notice how the psalm comes full circle. In the end, David is worshiping God. He takes his sin seriously enough that he then dedicates himself to basically telling his story and warning other people. And it kind of reminds me of the AA program, the 12-step programs. As the alcoholic or the drug addict begins the program, they rely on the higher power. They totally admit, they recognize they are wrong. Their sinfulness. Actually, the word they use is their insanity. I think that's a pretty accurate way to describe sin. It is insane, really. Then, the person in AA dedicates themselves to help another person, to come alongside them. In other words, they can say to that person, I've been there, I've been in that ditch, I've gone off the road at that curve, slow down, don't do what I did. And that is what David is doing here at the end of his repentance prayer, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Now, when you think about the life of King David, he had long been aware of all that what God had done for him. As a boy, he had fought Goliath. He'd been chosen at an early age to be the king of Israel. He was loved by God as a man after his own heart. He knew 
verse 1, that the Lord is full of compassion, but at the same time, he had sinned gravely. And it brings us back again to verse 7. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Really, that is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? There is nothing better than knowing that you are forgiven and you are cleansed. The waking nightmare is over. Guilt taken away by the Lord Jesus Christ. The preacher John Dunn once said in one of his sermons on Psalm 51 verse 7, he said it might be translated like this, Purify me from my sins, and thou shalt unsin me. I love that. Unsin me. God promises that he will wash the sinner, you and me, whiter than snow. He will unsin us through the cross. That is the expectation part of the third principle of repentance prayer the expectation that God will fulfill his promise that he is committed to you and I because of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though it, they are like red crimson, they shall become like pure white wool. David's own experience taught him that getting right with God was a matter of the heart. All of the Bible points ahead to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain for you and for me. We glory in the fact that we are forgiven and we walk day to day in repentance. The Bible encourages us and encourages us, and it says this, it's his mercy. In other words, it is the love of God that leads us to repentance. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for this powerful psalm from King David. And we pray, Lord, that the cleansing, that the reality of sins forgiven would wash over us today. And Lord, if there's anything in us that needs to change, Lord, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you will show us and that we will seek a new heart in that area. So Father, we praise you, we bless you, and we would pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. That this day may be holy, good, and joyful. We pray to you, O Lord. That we may offer to you our worship and our work. We pray to you, O Lord. That we may strive for the well-being of all creation. We pray to you, O Lord that in the pleasures and pains of life, we may know the love of Christ and be thankful. We praise you, O Lord, that we may be bound together by your Holy Spirit in communion with St. Hilda and all of your saints, entrusting one another and all our life to Christ. We pray to you, O Lord. And we pray for those that are on our hearts today. We call to mind our own families, the situations that weigh heavy on us, the people that need our prayers, that need healing, they need restoration, they need encouragement, they need forgiveness. And we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit even now to touch the people that we are praying for. We know that God is not limited by time or space. He's not limited by computers 
or online services, but he can work right now, right now, through his spirit to bring restoration, hope, and encouragement. And if you're in that category today that needs healing, restoration, encouragement, we pray that even now, God's Holy Spirit will bring you comfort and healing and grace. If there's an area of your life that you know needs to change, we pray that God would give you clarity and strength and encouragement to make those necessary changes in your life. We continue to pray for the Church of God. We pray for Anik and Bishop Charlie. We pray for Archbishop Foley Beach, Primate of the Anglican Church of North America. We continue to pray for our world, and we do pray that, Lord, you would protect us during these uncertain times with COVID-19. We pray, Lord, that this pandemic would soon end. In the meantime, Lord, give us strength to continue. Make our wills eager to obey and our hands ready to heal. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. And we give you thanks for all of the blessings of this life. Father, we thank you for the health in our bodies. We thank you, Lord, for our faith in the Lord Jesus, for the experience of the cross and the resurrection, for the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We are so grateful, Lord, for all of your goodness, for your loving kindness, and for your compassion. Make our voices one with all of your people in heaven and on earth. And gathering all our prayers, we say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. And we pray that you would have a blessed week. Mm -hmm.